All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is uh, Pepe Marquez. I'm an experimental scientist uh, with expertise in optoelectronic materials. Until very recently, I was a postdoc at the Helmut Centrum Berlin, and since February, I joined the Fema team. And I'm going to talk today about ELAB FTW and how it would look like a setup for, for a simple lab. So first, I would like to list uh, some facts about this uh, ELN. So ELAB FTW is a free open source ELN, which is based on MySQL database. It runs on a browser. Uh, it's extremely flexible, and you can customize it to your needs. It has a well-documented and easy to use API, which will allow you to automate your workflow and interface with your instruments in your lab, uh, if you wish to. This is not going to be covered, uh, the API part. We are we're only uh, going to talk about the user interface in this talk. And <clears throat> the documentation on how to, how to install, customize, and run ELAB FTW can be found in these web pages uh, in here. Uh, so you are uh, welcome to have a look at them. And in the interest of time, uh, I, I will not just cover the installation. I will go directly into the user interface. But if there are questions about it, I'm more than happy to discuss uh, any of these. And there's also a relatively large community discussing the usage of ELAP FTW in Dieter and GitHub. And I think it is, it's worth, if you're interested in the product, to, to have a look at it. So <clears throat> let's assume now that you have already an installation of ELAP FTW running in your lab. So you can this uh, you can install it yourself in your local server in your lab, or maybe the installation is provided by the IT department of the University of Research Institute. And then at your starting point, you will have um, you will be part of a team, and you will have an empty ELN, which it looks uh, like this. Huh? So then in the main page, uh, Christoph also showed this yesterday. We have uh, five tabs in here. First is the experiment tab, which is the one that we are showing. Uh, and this is where the list of the experiments that you register will be displayed. And then you can create experiments by clicking this create button in here. And if you create, click the arrow in here, you can select templates if you have predefined them. Then is the database tab. And then there is where your lab inventory items that you have defined will be displayed. After a fresh installation uh, like this, then you will have the database completely empty and you will not be able to see anything. And in the Teams tab, um, this is um, there is a scheduler and a calendar that it can be used. Like for example, if you have defined instruments that are bookable, then you can just allocate like a time slot for this. You can also see some properties of your team, like who is part of this team, uh, who has access to what, if it's an admin or if it's a normal user or not. And then the search tab is just like a search uh, interface. So, <clears throat> so how to start with this? So. If you have never used an ELM before, uh, you just might intuitively just create in clicking on this create button in here, and then a window will pop up uh, with a generic uh, experiment template. And then you possibly will start like typing, hey, I'm taking this sample and I'm bringing to this instrument and I'm doing this measurement. Uh, but if you do it like this, you will be using ELAP FTW as a normal, uh, not taking up, like you would be, for example, OneNote. So to really benefit from the usage of an ELN, it is really important that you give a little bit of a structure, actually a decent structure to your ELN to go beyond its not taking capabilities. Uh, and I think this is what, what is going to be maybe the main topic of the, of the next slide. So um, I think it makes sense that you uh, do an example with your own case. Uh, in my particular case, I come from a Thin film optoelectronic lab, and I'm going to show an example of this particular case, and I hope it serves as inspiration for you to apply to your example. So, in um, the type of labs that I, I've been working before, uh, we uh, typically have samples, which are thin films. And uh, these thin films, uh, we can do several things with these thin films. First, we can just deposit these thin, these thin films or do processes. So, processes, uh, we we call um, to something that it, like it changes the sample. For example, this could be a uh, deposition of a new thin film by a physical vapor deposition method, like maybe an evaporation, but it could also be just heating uh, the film in a furnace. And then measurement could be the way, like how we characterize the sample. So um, it could be like an X-ray diffraction measurement or like a photoluminescence measurement, or maybe just uh, collecting some images in a microscope. I think this uh, becomes very clear. And then obviously to do these processes and these measurements, we need instruments. Um, and these instruments, um, 
depending on the instrument that you use, this might affect uh, the final properties of the sample that you're measuring. So for example, if you use different furnaces, uh, this might affect how uh, your sample looks like. So it's really important to register also which instruments that you're using in this. So if you collect a diffraction pattern, uh, depending on which uh, uh, diffractometer you used or which slits that you're using in your diffractometer, your diffraction pattern might look uh, different, uh, as well as the chemicals that you use for the experiments when you do some synthesis. So when you open these chemicals, or if there are impurities in these chemicals, this is really important to register in your ELN. So because uh, like in traditional ways, it was really difficult to, to track this link between the chemical status and the sample. And then finally, uh, besides the instrument, even the maintenance of the instruments might play a role. Like let's say that you have, for example, uh, vacuum based instrument and you change like a pump and then your vacuum level changes. Uh, so if you are if you have a tool that allows you to register this maintenance when you change this vacuum pump, it will also allow you to track if this has an influence in the properties of your of your samples or the experiments that you have done. So <clears throat> okay so now we uh, have uh, this, how we want to classify our lab and how do we implement this in ELAP FTW. So in ELAP FTW you can um, group these things in two type of classes. Uh, then it would be experiments and database items. So in experiments, in my particular case, they will go things like, for example, um, spin coating of a thin film, physical vapor deposition of a thin film, or simply a hot plate annealing, just putting the sample in a hot plate. This could be a process and it will go to experiment. And we also have uh, measurements that it will go into experiments. This could be like to have an X-ray diffraction measurement, or maybe an X-ray fluorescence measurement or a current voltage scan uh, JV measurement. And then database uh, items uh, would be uh, my samples. So uh, my samples could be like part of the inventory of my lab. Um, the samples will contain the sample ID and more information about the sample, but it will also be the processing setups uh, that I use, the characterization setups, and maybe my chemicals and, and the maintenance status of, of this. And if we classify these, then ELAP FTW allow us to link uh, these things together. For example, if you do a physical vapor deposition, uh, then you use a sample to do this physical vapor deposition, you can link to each other. But at the same time, you can link these to the instrument that you have used to do this experiment and the chemicals that you have used to run this evaporation. So how do you follow now you have classified um, your items in between experiments and database uh, items, which are the type of things that you can do in ELAP FTW? What is the next thing? So the next thing is to create templates for these experiments or for this database. Um, and I particularly focus in creating metadata fields in these templates um, for the data that needs manual input in my workflow. Uh, so for example, if there are instruments that uh, acquire uh, data automatically, um, like for example, like an X-ray diffraction, then you will have a file that it has like intensity values to theta values. And it might also contain the wavelength of your uh, X-ray source. Um, but uh, in that file is not registered where you place the sample in the, in the diffractometer, so you don't know which uh, sample you're hitting. So the position of the sample are the metadata fields that are uh, that you ex extra need to define. And then you can also define templates to register your lab inventory and the relevant information that you might want to collect. Uh, and I think at some point, I think the best way is just, uh, we just jump into a demo um, and see a little bit like how, how the workflow in a lab uh, will look like. And let me just change my screen. Um, right, that's not what I wanted to show. Um, okay, can you see my browser now? I... Yes. Yes, okay. All right, so now we have in an already um, installed uh, instance of ELAP FTW where I have already defined all these templates for these techniques that I listed before and also my database. So we are now in the experiments tab. And this is the list of experiments that I've got like inside my uh, ELAP. It contains the title of experiment, some tags, where, which category I give and the owner. I am the owner because it's a local installation. So I'm, there's not many people, but if you have several people in the team and you have access to their data, you will be able to see the experiments of the other people. So then if we go to the database, uh, here it will be listed the database items that I have defined in my lab. And then in here, we can like filter them by category. 
so I've got like uh, defined samples, for example. Uh, and then in here, these are the uh, samples that I that I have uh, that I have in in my logbook. Then if we go to measurement instruments, these are the measurement instruments that I've got in my lab. And then uh, these uh, items will contain information about the uh, instrument itself. Like for example, if I go to this diffractometer, then you can register in here information about the diffractometer. Like you can uh, look at more details in here and it's located in this uh, lab. You can do different type of configurations with it and so on. You can also attach if you have, a, the instrument has a certificate, for example, uh, in this case, it has a NIST uh, certificate. You can just like have it linked to the instrument and you can uh, visualize it on the go. And likewise, you can also have your manuals linking here. So if you're working on the lab, you just want to have a quick look at the manual as you are working on, you just click on it and then you just jump uh, directly onto that. Mm. So, uh, yeah, uh, processing instruments could be exactly just basically the same concept, but instead of with characterization with processing. So I don't think I need to cover that. And then maybe I can show also just chemicals is the, it would be the, the inventory of the chemicals that I've got in, in my lab. Uh, this I've got it in here. This uh, have imported them uh, from a CSV file. And then it contains several like different information, for example, the formula that is a powder and a body from alpha ether, and it's got like 98%, 98.5% of impurities. Um, I also have like a link to the safety data sheet. So it allows you to also manage these kind of things. So you're in the lab, you want to use this uh, chemical, but you are not 100% sure if you're handling like with care or with safety, you can, you just have it in here and you can just check it out uh, straight away. So it's kind of convenient. Uh, that thing. Uh, then is the um, team tab, which you have this calendar that I briefly mentioned before. I don't think I would like to go into detail, but you can use this like to book instruments and allocate this uh, if you have defined them. Uh, so in here. So now I guess that um, I'm just going to do a demo how it would be like a typical workflow in a lab. I'm just going to delete this uh, ELN tutorial sample and I'm going to try to create it again. Oh, I've got my some window in the middle of it. So, all right. So I would start like creating one sample. So I will go to my database item and I will click in here and create. It will ask me which type of uh, item do I want to create. I select sampling here, and then it pops up the um, template that I have defined for my sample. So it comes with a title. I'm going to put E L N tutorial sampling here. And you can add some tags if you want to for searchability afterwards. Uh, and put like some tags like this. Uh, it also, you can use the tags to classify experiments if you wanted to or, or database items. Uh, I would be the owner. So all of these extra fields that come in here, I have predefined, uh, they come uh, with a JSON structure. Uh, if, there, if somebody's interested, I can show the details of, after it. So this you need to define yourself. It would be the owner and the sample ID would be whichever convention you have in our lab. Let's just put like 2022, for example, as today as an example. Then I am creating this sample today. It would have a length of 50 millimeters times uh, 50 millimeters. And I would use uh, soda lime glass as my substrate. And since the sample is mine and it doesn't come from any collaboration, then I don't need to fill anything else. Okay, so I think I've got everything I need for my sample. I just save it and yeah. Let's do now some experiments with uh, this sample. So I go to experiments and then now it's the same thing. I create one experiment and now I'm going to do, for example, a physical vapor deposition on top of the substrate. Uh, so I open this and I've come with the uh, template that I've got uh, defined this. I'm not going to have a, a light perovskite. I'm actually going to have another material. So I'm going to remove these tags in here. Um, I'm going to have a uh, testerite material, which is the compound I did my PhD thesis on. And I'm going to write it in here just in case I want to use these to find it out later. Uh, 
Okay, so for this particular experiment, I've defined that the only thing that I need as fields is the operator, because uh, all the other important data that it comes, it, I can collect it from the uh, file that the instrument produces. But I define here some steps uh, to remind me to um, that I that I need to add links to this data. So I use these steps as a reminder uh, to collect all the necessary data that I need to contextualize my my experiment, my PVD deposition in this case. So first thing I need to add the link to the latest PVD status. So this would be uh, the maintenance status of this uh, machine that I've got in here called as status on hardware. So I look the to the last thing that I register in here. The crucible filling and quest balance, uh, quest balance check. So I link this, and I link this to the experiment. So I can take this. Um, now the chemicals that I'm going to use uh, for this experiment, this is gonna be maybe some, oh, I go to chemicals here. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use copper selenide. I am also gonna use uh, zinc uh, selenide. And I'm going to use tin selenide. So these are the chemicals that I'm going to use. And then I will add a link to the sample that I'm gonna use. This is the sample that I have created before, which it was called ELN something, ELN tutorial sample. And I'm going to upload the log files after the deposition. So, I've got this status as running. So when the deposition is finished, then I can pass this to success. You can also define the type of status that you want. And then I can just uh, attach uh, a file here, or upload a file. Uh, you can just drop it. Uh, I will just, this will be PVD process data. So this instrument produces like a CSV type of data, which contains the temperature of the process, the uh, pressure and, and so on. So I don't need to collect this. Uh, so I have done this. And then in here in the uh, rich text box, you can add like your annotations, like if you have observed something or if you collect some pictures um, of, of, the, of the data, let's put for example, one image of the sample. And then in here, you can just do like annotations from your observations. So this is free. So um, let's put for example, yeah, the samples do not look so very, so. Uh, more genius. So yeah, we finished with our evaporation, collecting our data. So now we can go back to the list and let's do some measurements on this sample now. So we go here and we're going to do an X-ray diffraction measurement. So, so again, I have defined already a template for this. Uh, in this particular case, I, uh, it's asking me for my operator, uh, the, the current of the tube, of the X-ray tube and the voltage, which I'm going to leave in 40. You can have like pretty fine values in here. And I'm going to measure in like 25 millimeters from the edge of the sample in the X direction and 25 millimeters from the Y direction. And he asked me that I need to link uh, to my sample in here. So I'm going to look for my sample again. Um, I finish, then I attach the uh, measurement file that I have collected. Uh, um, I've got already everything that I wanted to have from this experiment, uh, just from the collection. And then we can have this and that analysis going. And let's say that you are, for example, doing this measurement and you are sitting in the PC where this diffractometer is located. And this PC has a special license to a software that you want to check something, you can, uh, do some analysis on, on the fly. So you can put, for example, yeah, first you can put, for example, some images of where you um, place your sample in your diffractometer. So you register this very easily, just copy and paste it in here. And then let's say that you just do some analysis and plot uh, some patterns and look at some references, then you can just like drop it in here and say like, this particular case is a little bit of more detailed analysis with a fit. Um, so this is basically, you can have annotations and even drop the structural files uh, that you have used for this. So for example, um, structure filing here. And I think the structure files, it has some visualization capabilities when you go out of um, edit mode. 
All right, so we've done our uh, measurement now. So if we go to view mode, you see how this looks like now, how the other users will see this. This is a structure file and you can see, this. I, I don't think this is super useful, but yeah, you can just have it in there. So, and I think the last thing that I, I'm just going to do to this sample is, um, let's say that you also do experiments that that you don't have an instrument that actually collects the data itself for you, but you actually need to manually input uh, the stuff, something that you would uh, typically register in your handwritten uh, notebook. So I just have an example of this. This could be like a, a hot plate and you know, you have a hot plate in your lab and you just want to put your sample one minute in there, um, but the hot plate doesn't have like a data registering thing, but it's really important to register um, to register these experiments and to link to these uh, samples. So I've defined already a template for this. I will, you, I will do this hot plate annealing in nitrogen. I am going to do it today because it's in nitrogen, my relative humidity will be very low, something like this, just as an example. And I will have uh, 60 seconds my sample in the hot plate and uh, 200 degrees Celsius. And I guess this, is just, I register my experiment and then if we go back to the experiments tab, then it tells me, oh, it tells me that I have forgotten in here to add the link to the sample. So this is why these uh, steps are, are good reminders. So I go back to the experiment, I go to edit mode. And I link my sample where I've done this. And I just remove this step, my reminder. And this is basically one example of usage of this. So yeah, so if we go to the database, then we have our sampling here, what we have created. If we click on it, we see the definition of the sample that we have done and also the related experiments uh, that we have in here. So if we click in show related, it tells you that, yeah, first you have done a, physical vapor deposition on the sample, then you have done an XRD uh, measurement, and then we've done a hot plate annealing on that. And then you can just go deeper on it. Like for example, if we go to the physical vapor deposition, it contains all the information. And at the same time, all the uh, stuff that we've used in here. So if we go to the status of the machine, the latest status of the machine, uh, where we have updated something, it tells me that I had I put these materials in the crucibles and I weighted like 20 milligrams in there. Um, this might be done by you or might be done by a technician of your lab. Um, I, the quartz balance status was at uh, this time and I did these changes uh, at this hour. So, I mean, I think with this, uh, I'm showing basically everything what I wanted to show in my time allocation. And I guess that now maybe we can have some, some room for some questions or for some further demonstration if anybody's interested in that. I don't know. I haven't been yes. able to control my time very well. I'm really sorry if I've gone a little bit long. No, no, it's all fine. Uh, thank you, Pepe. Uh, very nice presentation and demonstration. And indeed, there were uh, some questions immediately. Uh, before going to the, uh, to the questions and answers uh, session, I'm asking you again uh, that please uh, rename yourself in Zoom. So you just right click on your name and then uh, rename. And then you can put in a bracket your affiliation. So we really know actually uh, with whom we are talking about. It really helps us in our bookkeeping. So please do it. And I can immediately read the first question, uh, which was coming actually from uh, Markus uh, Vogarten. Uh, which role you've been in, uh, Pepe, when you did this demonstration? You were an ordinary user or you were the super user or which kind yeah. of roles uh, have you filled? Yeah, so you can be three things in ELAP FTW. You can be a sys admin. So this is the system administrator. So this defines uh, the teams itself and all like the server parts on this. Then you can be an administrator and this has like um, team uh, leading roles. So you, you can give uh, rights to different users within your team and define, uh, give access to the people to define their own templates. Um, so, but, in this login, I am an admin in this team, but everything that I've done, that I've shown is 
it can be done by a normal user because I haven't done anything special that I admin needs to do. Like if you, if you, if if an admin allocates that only admins can define templates, uh, then to define templates you need to be an admin of the team. Yeah. Thank you very much. Another question comes uh, from uh, Alexei Nefedov. If you can uh, now, you can switch on your camera and your microphone, please. Okay, uh, thanks uh, for a nice presentation um, from uh, Carlos from KIT. And we also use this lab of TV. And I have the next question. Uh, you told us about, well, small lab application, or really it's one person application. But uh, rather often you use the same uh, equipment uh, for different samples from different groups or different colleagues. Also, you can, go, uh, can get samples for your measurements from your partners from another institutions and so on. How you organize this communication? really because well we have this and you didn't tell about this uh, team uh, group uh, parts of this lap of tv when you can divide of different groups and or teams uh, and uh, in our case in this in our institute we have a team for about 100 scientists and i have uh, some a rather complicated mixture between equipments, uh, uh, different uh, samples, and so on. And up to now, we have no real uh, communication between different groups in one team. Have you such problem, or you have simply the small group and you have no such problem at all? Thanks. Um, thank you, Alexei. Um, so this demonstration, I put the focus on the user, like the experimentalist usage. Um, so uh, when you leave, when you are system admin or an admin, you can define the visibility of your experiments. So you can make them like publicly available. So if your URL is available for, for like outside of your uh, server and network and you make your experiments publicly available, everybody that has this link and has a user is able to, to look at this. Uh, so this, I guess it answers a little bit. I mean, you can define how you can transfer this. So if you uh, want to transfer uh, data across teams, uh, one thing it could be done is via the API. And the second thing that it could be done is just to export uh, the experiment as a dump. I think you can click on here and then export as a sieve. Uh, and then what this does, is this creates a JSON file that it contains all the data and the upload links of the experiment that you have exported. And if anybody else has like a team, he can import this into their team. And how to manage this for larger organizations, um, as you were mentioning, with like uh, some of the instruments are local in what lab, but some of the other instruments are like core lab instruments. I guess this is um, it's a little bit challenging. And I think this needs to be discussed at the IT department level of it. I don't think that, I'm not sure how this is, uh, a decision of the experimentalist itself or of a small more group, but I I can tell that I can see that this could be challenging. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question comes uh, from uh, Bernd Renlichhaus. Uh, you can now switch on your camera and microphone, please. Okay, good morning. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, also, two short questions concerning the um, communication to the outer world. So would it be possible that if you have an external system, say via an Excel file or whatsoever uh, database, um, could you from external uh, resources somehow link to particular experiments or database entries within uh, ELAP FTW? Uh, is question one, question two would be, can you also import data from maybe uh, predefined um, uh, information on experiments that have already been done or, or uh, partially done? Um, yes, I really hope I'm able to answer your question. Um, so yeah, 
in terms of uploads, you can just upload whatever you want into an experiment or a database item. But if you would, if, if your question is more related to like, let's say that in my lab, I, um, I've been registering during the last year experiments in Excel tables, and now I just want to transfer them uh, to ELAB FTW. Uh, obviously, via the API, you have a lot of control to it because you can define um, how these uh, Excel files would look in ELAP FTW. But I think the uh, user interface, like if you go to admin panel in here and you are an admin of a team, uh, you've got this import function uh, in here. And with oh. this, you can import, uh, it's got like a CSV importer, which you can import like several items from an Excel uh, spreadsheet. So let's say that I want to import, this is actually, I use it for importing my chemicals inventory. So you would choose your chemicals in here, for example, and then you check the delimiter and then you choose your CSV file and you need to predefine, so you need to uh, uh, tweak a little bit your Excel file. I've got an example in here, just in case this uh, question was coming. Uh, so, so this is, for example, a list of chemicals that I have imported from my inventory. So it contains the formula, the form, the supplier, the cast number, and blah, blah, blah. So the first column, if you label as title, it will import this uh, as the title of the database item, and this as fields. But these fields go into the rich text editor, which is sometimes not super convenient because it might be a little bit more tricky to parse, but I can show you how how this looks like once you have imported, like if you go to chemicals in here and you select uh, this, it looks like this, no? Now it's now in ELAP FTW and this is what it has imported. And this comes from this uh, CSV file that you are defining here. It's the same information. I don't know if this is too small, but just put it a little bit bigger, but it's exactly the same. Does this answer your question? Uh, the second one, yes. The first one is, can if, if you have this data within your ELAP uh, uh, FTW uh, on experiments and so forth, and you have um, maybe an, an outside kind of list of experiments, can you somehow provide from the outside a link that addresses directly this uh, uh, ELAP FTW information? Oh, I see now what you mean. Um... I mean, I guess you can have a URL, a URL uh, file. Uh, so for yeah. example, yes, I think you can define uh, in your experiments uh, templates, a field that is like a text string, which it contains a URL, a URL where these or the link experiments are linked to, and then oh. you can just follow up on that. I guess this could be a solution for this. Uh, I'm not sure if this is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and the answer. Indeed, we have uh, a few more questions. Uh, uh, Marcus is asking, uh, Marcus uh, Wolgatten, uh, what happens if you have huge amount of data, uh, how you can connect things uh, together? Uh, this we have already touched upon, uh, that sometimes you need a proper IT infrastructure to handle all these uh, lots of data and how to handle them via links or uh, mounting things under here and there uh, this is something which you have to discuss with your uh, it department yeah. another question is how much how big amount of data uh, you may collect uh, when you are working with 10 people for a year um, well in my view it really depends on which kind of experiments you are uh, you are doing with these 10 people uh, probably your previous experiments can you uh, can give you a, a nice hint uh, but maybe you will uh, get some answer actually from the next presentations uh, where we go into the details of how to handle this data in between different uh, entities like a data management system uh, which Nomad is providing and DLAB FTW which is just an ELN and how you can connect things together. So I suggest uh, to go to the next uh, presentation which will be then delivered by uh, Shajir Shabik.